Hello viewers, I am Dr. Robiu. I work as a lecturer in pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is wound healing part 1. Since wound healing is a very big topic, so I will upload videos about wound healing part by part. In part 1 of wound healing, we will briefly discuss about the definition of wound healing, basic concepts of regeneration and repair, followed by a brief discussion on types of cell according to their proliferative capability, steps of repair, granulation tissue and angiogenesis. In the second part of wound healing video that I will hopefully upload in a week, we will talk about cutaneous wound healing, healing by first and second intention, factors affecting wound healing, and complications of healing. Okay, so a lot of topic, so let's begin. First question, what is wound healing? So as written in your textbook, wound healing can be defined as body's response to injury in an attempt to restore normal structure and function. So I am repeating the definition again for my students. Wound healing can be defined as body's response to injury in an attempt to restore normal structure and function. And always remember wound healing involves two distinct processes. They are regeneration and repair. So now that we have defined wound healing, we must have some basic idea about regeneration and repair. So we will first begin with the concepts of regeneration. What is regeneration? When healing occurs by proliferation of parenchymal cell and in that type of healing usually there is complete restoration of the damaged cells that is regeneration so in regeneration there is proliferation of parenchymal cells and that proliferation is resulting in almost complete restoration of the damaged cells now we may be asking dr robule what is parenchyma always remember any organ has two part one is functional part and that is known as the parenchyma and always remember there is also some supporting structure and those are known as the stroma so whenever we are talking about regeneration there is proliferation of the parenchymal cells and they are resulting in complete restoration of the structure. Now what are the examples of regeneration? The most common example of regeneration is that of liver. Liver is a remarkable organ for regeneration. But before I tell you the clinical examples, I want to tell you a story and this story will help you remember the examples of regeneration. So have you heard the name Prometheus? Prometheus was a character of the Greek mythology. Prometheus was a titan and he stole the secret of fire from Zeus and gave it to humanity. That made Zeus very angry. So Zeus wanted to punish Prometheus. So what did Zeus do? Zeus tied Prometheus with a big rock and every day ego came to devour his liver. So as you can see, I have drawn a simplified image of Prometheus. Don't get scared. So this is a big rock. This is Prometheus, not very happy. And he is tied with this big rock. And suppose this is the ego and the ego is devouring his liver every day. But Miraculously, every night his liver, the remaining portion of his liver, used to regenerate so that the ego can 
continue this punishment over and over and over every day. And every night his remaining liver was getting regenerated. So always remember this story to remember that liver regeneration is a very common example of regeneration. So one of my students once asked me, Dr. Robil, what happened to Prometheus? Is he still under punishment? So as far as I know, there was another Greek hero named Hercules. I think at some point Hercules killed this bard and made Prometheus free. So anyhow, let's go back to today's topic. Let's not uh, talk about Greek mythology. So that is an example of regeneration. And in your textbook you will see that even after 60% of a liver has been removed, say for example from a donor, the remaining portion of the liver can regenerate and it can double its size in almost only one month. Okay, so that is an example of regeneration. But one thing I would like to add, you know the term regeneration that we use in pathology, this is not actually true regeneration. Say for example, when I gave you um, the example of liver, liver regenerate, but actually you have to remember that the regeneration is functional. The lobes that were resected during surgery, those lobes are gone. The regeneration is happening with the remaining lobes. And when the regeneration is happening from the remaining lobes, they are making a structure of liver that is functionally adequate, but the lobes that were lost during surgery, those um, architecture, those anatomical architecture won't be regenerated. So always remember that this regeneration is more functional than of accurate structural regeneration. In contrary, when we talk about regeneration that we see in some other species, say for example in amphibian, if you amputate one of their limbs, voila, after a few time, uh, an entire limb has been regenerated. So that is an example of true regeneration and the regeneration that we say in liver is in fact compensatory regeneration and always keep that in your mind. So now that we have talked about regeneration, now we will move on and talk about the concepts of repair. So when healing occurs by proliferation of connective tissue and that proliferation of connective tissue results in fibrosis and scarring, that is known as repair. So notice that in repair, there is no proliferation of the parenchymal tissue. There is proliferation of connective tissue. And that is the basic difference between regeneration and repair. Whereas in regeneration, the parenchymal cells were proliferating, but in repair, the connective tissue is proliferating. So now that we have discussed the basic concept of regeneration and repair, you may be asking which type of cell undergo regeneration and which type of cell undergo repair during the process of wound healing. And to understand that answer, we must go to the next topic and discuss the types of cell according to proliferative capability. And to discuss that thing, we also have to talk about cell cycle first. So cell cycle can be defined as the period between two successive cell division. As you can see, I have drawn a simplified image of a cell cycle here. Notice it has mainly four phases. The phases have unequal duration. They are M, G1, S and G2 phase. So let's talk about these phases briefly. So M phase is the phase during which cell division or mitosis takes place. So M stands for mitosis. After cell has divided, what happens? It goes into the G1 phase, which is also known as the gap 1 phase. During G1 phase, the cell begins its preparation for the next upcoming cell division. 
after G1 phase, the cell cycle moves into S phase and during which DNA replication or duplication of DNA takes place. And the idea behind this is you have to remember whenever we are doing cell division, everything is dividing into two half and they will go into the daughter cells. So if we don't double our DNA before cell division, the DNA number will become haploid. But we don't want that to happen, right? Unless we are talking about gametes. So therefore, before cell division, DNA number must double so that in every daughter cell, the number of DNA remains equal to that of the original mother cell. So S phase, during S phase, there is duplication of DNA, which is also known as DNA replication. S phase of the cell cycle is followed by gap 2 or G2 phase. And the function of G2 phase is to act as a proofreader during DNA replication. There may be some errors and those errors are checked out in G2 phase. And after G2 phase, there is M phase. The reason I am telling you about this cell cycle is very important and you will see why. So moving on to the topic that led us to this cell cycle. How can we classify cells according to their proliferative capability? We can classify them in three groups. They are labile cell, stable cell and permanent cell. And the labile cell, which are also known as continuously dividing cells, they are the cell which are continuously going from one cell cycle to the next cell cycle. So, those are the labile cells or continually, continuously dividing cells. What are the examples of these labile cells? They include surface epithelium, say for example the stratified squamous epithelium lining our skin, oral cavity, vagina, cervix, etc. It also includes the lining of the duct of excretory gland, the transitional epithelium that lines the urinary tract. The examples of labile cell will also include columnar cells of the gastrointestinal tract and the uterus, etc. So all these are examples of labile cell. Moving on to the next type of cell according to proliferative capability, the next group is known as stable cell and quiescent cell. Stable cell or quiescent cell. And they have low level of replication, however, when stimulated, they can rapidly divide. And where do they stay in the cell cycle? Stable cells are staying in this G0 phase. Notice from G1 I have drawn an arrow and have indicated another phase. This is G0 or resting phase and the stable cells are staying here. They are not replicating that much. They have low level of proliferating activity but whenever they are stimulated they can return to G1 phase and then rapidly proliferate. So that is known as stable cell. And always remember regeneration will occur in labile cells and stable cells. So the examples of stable cell include parenchymal cell of the liver, pancreas, kidney, vascular endothelial cell, mesenchymal cells such as the fibroblast, smooth muscle, it also includes lymphocyte and other leukocytes. Moving on to the last type according to proliferative capability, that was permanent cell. And as you can see from the image, permanent cells have left the cell cycle. Therefore, they no longer have ability to proliferate. And since they cannot proliferate, so they cannot regenerate. So always remember that permanent cells cannot regenerate. So whenever there is damage in permanent cell, healing will occur by connective tissue proliferation. That is via repair. 
Now, what are the examples of permanent cell? They include neurons, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle. So, now that we have cleared which type of cell will undergo regeneration and which type of cell will undergo repair, you have to remember one important thing. Repair and regeneration also depends on the extent of injury and also on inflammation. So, if the injury is extensive and there is, say for example, chronic inflammation, repair may predominate despite the fact that those injured cells might have regenerative capability. So also keep that thing in your mind that the repair and regeneration also depends on the extent of injury and presence of inflammation. So now that we have cleared the types of cell according to their proliferative capability, now we will move on further and discuss the steps of repair. Now there are two major processes involved in repair. They are formation of granulation tissue and wound contraction. So let's talk about these two things briefly. So what do we mean by granulation tissue? Granulation tissue are the hallmark of tissue repair. They got their name from their granular appearance on the surface of the wound. As a matter of fact, they are pink, soft and granular in appearance. But don't confuse granulation tissue with another pathological term that is granuloma. Never, because they are completely different things. Granuloma is the foci of granulomatous inflammation, whereas granulation tissue is the hallmark of tissue repair. So how does this granulation tissue form? It is formed in three phases, and they are inflammatory phase, clearance phase, and phase of ingrowth of granulation tissue. In the inflammatory phase, neutrophil and monocyte are the predominant cell. Then there is the phase of clearance during which the enzymes released from neutrophil as well as the autolytic enzymes released from the dying cells and by the help of macrophage the debris are cleared, the necrotic debris are cleared and in the phase of ingrowth of granulation tissue that is the major phase of granulation tissue formation and that phase again consists of two processes they are angiogenesis and fibrogenesis so let's talk about those two things as well now before discussing about angiogenesis I would like to mention another term that is vasculogenesis now vasculogenesis was a term used to denote development of blood vessel in the embryonic life either from angioblast or hemangioblast recall that angioblasts are one type of stem cell that develops embryonic blood vessel whereas hemangioblast is also stem cell which has both hemopoietic and angioblastic component that is they can develop both blood vessel as well as hemopoietic cells so vasculogenesis means development of blood vessel in the embryonic life either from angioblast or from hemangioblast whereas angiogenesis which is also known as neovascularization denotes development of blood vessel in adult life angiogenesis can happen in two ways angiogenesis can happen either from pre-existing blood vessel or it can happen from stem cells. So let's talk about these two processes one by one. So how does angiogenesis occur from pre-existing blood vessel? So as you can see I have drawn a simplified image to explain angiogenesis from pre-existing blood vessel. 
in the first step there will be vasodilation which is mediated by nitric oxide and there will be also increased vascular permeability that is mediated by the growth factor VEGF. Then what will happen? The basement membrane beneath the vascular endothelium will be disrupted and that will be disrupted by an enzyme known as matrix metalloproteinase because the idea is if we don't disrupt the basement membrane endothelial cells won't be able to migrate and go into the site of angiogenic stimuli so the next step after disruption of the basement membrane will be migration of endothelial cell towards the angiogenic stimuli and once angiogenic stimuli attracts endothelial cell the cell uh, will go to that site and there will be proliferation of endothelial cell behind that migrating endothelial cell okay so suppose this one was the first migrating cell it is going towards the chemotactic stimuli towards the angiogenic stimuli and behind that there is proliferation of newer endothelial cell then what will happen there will be maturation of the endothelial cell and the proliferating endothelial cells will remodel into a capillary tube and in the last stage of angiogenesis from new blood vessel periendothelial cells will accumulate they may be called pericyte or they may be called vascular smooth muscle cell so that was in short about angiogenesis from pre-existing blood vessel Regarding angiogenesis from stem cell, they derive from something that is known as EPC, that is endothelial precursor cell. And they are found in the bone marrow and then they migrate into the site of angiogenic stimuli. However, the exact mechanism by which this migration occurs is still uncertain. So now that we have discussed briefly about angiogenesis, now we will move on and discuss about the second um, thing that happens in the phase of ingrowth of granulation tissue and that was fibrogenesis. Now always remember these new blood vessels, they are not floating in thin air. As a matter of fact, they are surrounded by some amorphous ground substance and matrix and also there is fibrosis around this blood vessel and um, there is presence of fibroblast the fibroblast may derive from fibrocyte or they may derive from mitosis from pre-existing fibroblast as well and one thing you have to remember is you will also see some special type of cell here as well which is called myofibroblast and they are intermediate they are characteristics are intermediate between fibroblast and smooth muscle. So these are the things that will happen during fibrogenesis and the last thing that we will talk in today's discussion is about wound contraction. Recall that I said repair happens in two processes. First there is granulation tissue formation and then there is wound contraction. Wound contraction usually um, begins within two to three days and it's uh, usually completed by two weeks and the major contributor um, that uh, gives this wound contraction is the cell named myofibroblast like I previously said they have characteristics intermediate between fibroblast and smooth muscle cell and they can contract the wound as much as 80% of its original size. That is, the myofibroblast can reduce the size of the wound almost 80%. So their role in wound contraction is vital. So this concludes the first part of wound healing video. I hope this video was helpful. If you like my videos, do comment share subscribe and let me know i will try to upload part two hopefully within a week where we will talk about cutaneous wound healing healing by first and second intention factors affecting wound healing and complications of healing so until next time take care and stay blessed 
Thank you.